there is a place to which, for over a century, the greatest horses and the greatest jockeys have traveled. The journey carries with it only one goal, one dream. A ride to victory in the fabled Run for the Roses. The place is Churchill Downs in Louisville, Kentucky. The year is 1955. A young Willie Shoemaker aboard Swaps would make his first trip to the Kentucky Derby winner's circle. Shoemaker returned to the Derby spotlight three more times during the next 30 years, but it was this Derby day in May of 1986 that would live with the shoe forever. At the age of 54, Shoemaker teamed up with a 17 to one long shot named Ferdinand. And for Shoemaker, he found himself riding against jockeys young enough to be his sons. At the start of the race, Shoe and Ferdinand were down on the rail, pinched back. Heading into the first turn, they found themselves dead last. But as the horses entered the famed Churchill Down stretch, Shoe saw a hole and boldly moved Ferdinand down to the inside, where they found racing room. Together, they catapulted through on the rail and ran down the leaders. And here comes Ferdinand on the rail. In the front of Furlong, it's Ferdinand getting the lead. Amazingly, Shoe's fourth derby win came more than three decades after he had first smelled the sweet scent of the roses. Shoemaker already was a living racing legend. Now he was on top of the world once again with a victory that showed them all he wasn't through. Not yet. After any race, the winner's circle is a happy place to be in. But after a Kentucky Derby, it's pure bedlam. Wild emotion, joy, and excitement. And it was all that and more this time, because this was a very popular win. Bill Shoemaker's fourth Kentucky Derby was truly a moment to savor. For the jockey, for his wife Cindy, and for their young daughter Amanda, who was watching on television back in California. Even for Bill Shoemaker, however, not everything had always come up roses. It was 1968, nearly 20 years earlier, at Santa Anita Racetrack in Los Angeles. As he walked into the paddock, Shoemaker at 37 was at the top of his game, recognized by his peers as the best. He had also become the most successful jockey in the country. In 19 years, he'd racked up 5,785 wins, three Kentucky Derbies, held five national riding titles, and won over $40 million in purses. And he had a yearly income in six figures, all the rewards of a man who had made it big. Yes, the luck's been good, 19 years without a crack up. But on January 23rd, the luck stops. Shoemaker was on a horse named Bell Bush, and a young apprentice up ahead made a bonehead move. Shoe saw it coming, but there was nothing he could do. Skill and courage and street smarts can protect you some of the time, but with thousands of pounds of horse flesh and jockeys going down around you, 
Sometimes even the best can't escape. With a broken right leg repaired with a surgical pin, Shoemaker was soon facing reporters again. Yeah, I can remember it pretty well. What happened? Well, an uh, apprentice boy, uh, Juan Gonzalez, I believe his name was, he had his horse, uh, was trying to get through a, in between two horses, and uh, he didn't make it. And he went down, and I was right behind him, and I couldn't get out of his way. I couldn't... Uh, go around him uh, because it was a horse on the outside of me, so I just had to go right over the top of him. And that was it. When you look back over your career, it's been amazing the way you've beaten the odds. I think I've been pretty lucky so far, Gil. Really, I'm not, uh, I'm naturally disappointed that I can't ride Damascus, but I think I've been awfully lucky over these 18 years I've been riding. I've never had anything really uh, seriously wrong. This is the most serious thing that's ever happened to me, so... And it could have been worse, so I'm very thankful. In Shu, the will to win burned strongly. And so by the time he left the hospital, he was already planning a comeback. The rehabilitation begins, hobbling down the Sunset Strip near his home in Beverly Hills. His father was a cotton farmer in Texas, and he was born in a town called Fabens on August 19, 1931. When a doctor delivered him, he weighed two and a half pounds. The doctor just left him on the bed and said, He'll die before the night's over. But his grandma put him in a shoebox, turned the cook stove on, left the oven door cracked open to let air in, and the doctor was wrong. She incubated him through the night, and he didn't die. They named the two and a half pounds William Lee. At 10, he moved to California. At 14, he got a job at a ranch, and from the first day he knew that's where he belonged, among horses. Up at five, watering the training track, mucking out the stalls, rubbing down the stock, $75 a month with room and board. Shoemaker had been a tiny kid, to be sure, and like a lot of small boys, he had to prove he was tough. With his size, the advice was inevitable. Son, you ought to be a jockey. By 1949, he was just that, a jockey. And he was tough. He had ridden against the best riders, and he had ridden the best horses. The topless joints were closed now, and the traffic was thin. As he stared in at the sleek jaguars behind the plate glass, under those polished hoods was plenty of horsepower. But he had known another kind of horsepower. Like Swaps. In addition to being his first Kentucky Derby winner, Swaps held the world's record at a mile, a mile and a sixteenth, a mile and five-eighths. They draped him in roses again in 1959 on Tommy Lee, and he made it a triple on Lucky Debonair in 65. He'd reached into the pot many times with round table, ten hundred thousand dollar purses and the San Juan Capistrano on olden times, nursing a speed horse on the lead for a mile and three quarters. It was a race he'd never forget. And there was another one he'd never forget, one that got away. It was the 1957 Kentucky Derby. And in the stretch, the shoe on the outside horse, Gallant Man, had caught up with the leader, Iron Liege, and seemed about to go on by him when something almost imperceptible happened to Gallant Man and Iron Lees went on to win the race by a nose. In slow motion, the film showed that Shoemaker, in the heat of the stretch drive, had misjudged the finish line. He had stood up for a fraction of a second. When he realized his mistake, he frantically urged his horse on, but came up a nose short. But Shoemaker never alibied about his mistake. He could have said afterward that the horse had taken a bad step or ducked in, but he didn't. Gallant Man's owner, Ralph Lowe, was so impressed with Shoe's honesty, he went out the next day and bought him a shiny new Cadillac convertible. But it was still a bitter loss. There were still good times, though. He remembered all the awards, the big wins. They meant a lot, 
more than she would realize then. He remembered the laughs, too. And he remembered the excitement of the race, the thrill when everything was going right, like coming from dead last through a wall of horses to get them at the wire. But enough of remembering. Right now, there was work to be done. Thirteen months go by. The boring repetition of therapy, working on the leg with weights. Visiting the track on crutches or at home pumping away on the stationary bicycle, it takes patience to wait for the healing to complete itself. The leg continued to bother him, but somehow the pain seemed to be lessening. The year rolls around and with it, the Santa Anita meeting. The shoe gets out in the mornings to try out how it feels to get up on a stable pony again, anxious to know if the injury has cost him anything in his skills. He begins to gallop horses once more and the leg feels good. But you can never tell what an injury will do to a jockey until he's race riding again. From the beginning, Shoemaker had depended on Harry Silbert as his agent, the man in charge of lining up horses for the jock to ride. Harry was glad to be back at work, too. On February 7th, 1969, the fans and horsemen who had already loved him for two decades were ready to see what the shoe could do. They were hopeful, supportive, but, well, racing is a tough game. They were skeptical. It's best not to expect too much. Shoemaker's agent had lined up three mounts. His comeback would be no easy day. The first two horses were owned by Mrs. Liz Tippett of the famous Langolan farm and trained by Charlie Whittingham who legs him up on the maiden filly, Princess Endeavor. Shoemaker was understandably a little nervous as the starting gate opens. The filly, number 12, breaks well from the outside. Princess Endeavor is third, three quarters of a length. Starry Bridge is fourth, by one length. Polly N between horses is fifth on the rail. Turning for home, leading thought in front by a head. On the outside, from Carey is second. Princess Endeavor is third, by two and a half lengths. Polly Ann is, oh, here comes Princess Endeavor on the outside. Into the stretch is fourth, leading thought in front, and Princess Endeavor on the outside. Here it's fourth, leading thought, and Princess Endeavor. No matter what happens now, they know the shoe is back. You couldn't have had a better outing on your uh, first trip back on the track. What's your no, comment? Well, 
I really couldn't have. I don't think I could have wrote a script any better than the way it turned out. I had a, was laying third right behind the leaders with a lot of horses, and when I got ready to let her run, I moved around, and here she came. And how about the leg? How does it feel? Oh, it feels great. Feel uh, good. How do you feel in general now? Do you think Well, you... I feel a lot better than I thought I would. I thought I'd be a little tired, but I really am not. A little exciting? Yes, you know, your, your nerves are a little bit up, keyed up because I haven't ridden in a year, but outside of that, I feel great. There was a distinct buzz in the crowd. They could hardly wait for Shoe's next mount. The slide is up. There they go. The next ride is on Racing Room, a pretty fair allowance horse. He's the number one down on the rail, and he doesn't break as well as the filly. Fourth, Ottawa Hills is fifth, and Steel Blake. Around the turn to Megon. On the rail in front, Brand Neck on the outside. Great J is second to length and one half. The rest goes toward the neck. Ottawa Hills is worth. There goes Race Crew moving out now. Turning from home to Miga in front by three quarters of a length. Great J is second by two and a half length. The rest goes third by a head. On the inside, Ottawa Hills is fourth, two and a half lengths, and uh, Racing Room into the stretch of the Miga in front. Three quarters of a length, the Great J is second by a length and one half. Here comes Racing Room. Racing Room, the edge of the Miga. Racing Room on the inside. Racing Room is coming through. Two up, two wins. This game is easy. The buzz in the crowd gets louder as Shu brings his third mount up to the starting gate. Just one more. Could Jay's double make it his third win on the first day back? comes, whipping left-handed to get the horse outside. And then switching to the right hand in mid-stretch. He gets Jay's double home, too. That is some comeback. And so it was, after 13 months, three mounts, three wins. It was a time to exult and triumph, but it was also an emotional drain. What did Bill Shoemaker do that night to celebrate? Did champagne flow? No. No, he went home, and it was tears that flowed. Tears of gratitude and appreciation. A long ordeal was over. It's 5 a.m. at the racetrack, and it's a magical time. There's a little nip in the air as the wind blows off the snow-covered mountains behind Santa Anita. Stable area is stirring now, and there's a smell of horse liniment and coffee everywhere. Stalls are being mucked out, buckets filled. The automatic hot walkers cool out the morning workouts. The sun gets higher, the morning lengthens. It's a little past seven, 
when the shoe gets to the track to work out Charlie Woodingham's fiddle aisle. It's a special time of the day for Shoemaker, too. It's a chance to greet old rivals like Johnny Longdon. Johnny, how you feel? <laughs> it's a chance to relax, away from the pressures of the afternoon's racing. Do we want to jog him? Let's jog him a little bit and loosen him up. John, you want to go off a little bit in front of me? Because he'll... You go off a little bit in front of me if you will, because he takes a lunge and a dive sometimes and runs about a sixteenth before I can get him. Yeah, because when I turn around, he's gone. He don't wait for nobody. Whittingham wants Fiddle Isle to get in a good workout, so he puts Johnny Sellers on a quick stable mate to pace shoe. The outrider turns the big horse loose, and away they go. Ooh. Ooh. Hold that tiger, John. Oh, this, hey, these two dudes want to run this morning. You got him, John? Hold him, John. Wait for me, John. Okay, let him go. Just right. We did such a beautiful, we did a be such a beautiful job. We had old Whittingham smiling from ear to ear. First time. After the morning workouts, it's time for a cup of coffee and some good talk with friends. But now it was time to go to work. Time for the routine preparation before the day's races. Even though a jockey's concentration is on the afternoon's work to come, invariably in the springtime, his thoughts turn to Churchill Downs and the upcoming Derby. Just a few days before, Shoemaker had been to Kentucky to tune up his Derby mount, a horse named Arts and Letters. After a sparkling win in the bluegrass stakes, the shoe felt he had a heck of a chance to win the derby. He could almost smell the roses. Okay, shoe, it's time to go get them. Everything was going right. It seemed that bad luck had passed Shoemaker by. Maybe it seemed that way, but it had not. It was May 3rd at Hollywood Park. Shoemaker was expecting a routine race on a routine afternoon. He was to ride an ordinary filly named Puna's Day. It happened almost too quickly to comprehend. One moment routine, the next tragedy, pain, terror. Dr. Robert Curlin has been the shoe's friend for many years, and he rushed to the jockey's side as Shoe looked up at Harry Silbert and could only say, I'm hurt, Harry. I'm hurt real bad. 
They're running the Derby this coming Saturday, but you won't get to the Derby, not this year. The first injury had been career-threatening. This time, it was life-threatening. Examinations and x-rays uh, reveal that he had sustained multiple fractures of the pelvis with uh, dislocation. The pelvis had splintered in five places, a ruptured bladder and a dislocated sacroiliac a paralyzed left leg. Dr. Curlin had him on the operating table for two and a half hours. Back east, they ran the derby that Saturday and Majestic Prince beat Shoe's horse by a neck. When they heard how bad his injuries were, there were a lot of people who said, that's it, they don't come back from that. Not without some kind of a miracle. So once more at age 40, and often in severe pain, Bill Shoemaker was a man back in therapy, a man being tested all over again. Six months, that's what the doctor gives you, six months just to be able to drive a car again or make it up a flight of stairs. But you astonish them all. You make it in three. In the mornings when the track attendants are busy at work, you go out to the track and jog around the empty oval. You're worried. Two bad spills in 15 months. Maybe it's time to quit. There isn't anything to prove by getting up on a horse again. You've ridden 25,000 horses. What's there to prove? You love racing, but still a man has to walk away sometimes, even from something he loves. You've held a hot hand for a long time. Why press it? Still, it's hard to think of the paddock judge calling riders up and you not being in the post parade. All right. All those years, you've been a race rider first and foremost, and you're not ready to be anything else. It's the next winter, the 1970 meeting at Santa Anita, and Shu had come back, but there was something missing. As he struggled through the first few weeks, it became obvious that he would not be the leading rider, a position that had been virtually certain for 17 years. Maybe he was sitting a little differently on a horse. Or maybe the horrendous pounding his body had taken over the last years had seeped away a little of the skill or the nerve. From the patrol towers, they put the binoculars on him. Even Charlie Whittingham had said, hey, Shoe, what's wrong? There was nothing Shoe or Charlie or anyone else could put a finger on, but something was different. There was always a distinctive look to the way Shoe rode a race. It's been said that Bill Shoemaker bothered a horse less than any other jockey. The craft of a jockey is not just skill and intelligence and physical conditioning. It's timing and touch and intuitive reaction. When that timing is missing, so are the winds. Whatever the problem, something was different. The familiar scenes had shifted. Chu was losing the close ones, losing the races he spent a lifetime winning. Even Shoemaker had to wonder, were the sweet rides over 
He didn't think so, but he could no longer be sure. The walk back through the tunnel to watch the replay was seeming longer. Had time passed him by? Shoemaker would not give up. As he slowly battled through his slump, his timing began to reappear, and there emerged a brighter picture. The world record for number of races won, 6,032, had been set in 1966 by Johnny Longdon. After that win, the tough old warrior hung up his tack to become a trainer, reasonably sure that the record would stand for a while. In the summer of 1970, Shoemaker was winning again, and he had Longdon's record in his sights. Southern California racing now moved down to Del Mar, a seaside track that Bing Crosby and his pals had built in the 1930s. Despite the relaxed atmosphere of the beach, Shoemaker was preparing himself mentally for the final assault on the coveted record. By that time, his confidence was back. After all, hadn't he won six races on a single day in June at Hollywood Park? It was time for cameras and countdowns. Win number 6,000 was a colt named Escomal. winds were coming rapidly now, and every time he dismounted, there were more autographs to sign. The tension mounted, the winds piled up, the pursuit got hotter. He tripled on September 1st, and he went to 6,027. He was five away. A colt named Havko made it 6,029. Four more, and he'd be home. He narrowed it to two with Puna Downs. Then on Saturday, September 5th, Escamal went wire to wire on the grass, and there it was. Flashing on the tote board in the afternoon sunlight was the number 6,032. The shoe had tied Longdon. On Labor Day, the excitement was at fever pitch. Shu needed only one winner to go past Longdon. His mount in the fourth race was a two-year-old filly named Darris Jay. She was no great racehorse, but she had a chance to be Shu's partner in history. Even a professional like Shoemaker couldn't treat this as an ordinary moment. After all those years and all those races, he was just one step from the pinnacle. There they go. Warm response is going to the front. There's Jay, a second on the rail. Market reaction, third. I want to win is fourth. Hasty Nim, fifth. Then Sister Cat Burden, Phantom Gray. Going into the far turn, it's There's Jay in front by a length and a half. Warm response is second by a neck. Market reaction, third by a length and a half. Hasty Nim, fourth by one length. I want to win is fifth. Sister Cat Bird, sixth. And Phantom Gray around the far turn, it's There's Jay in front. 
drawing out by two and a half lengths. Warm response, this second by a length and a half. Market reaction, third by one length. I want to win, is fourth, Hasty Nymph and Sister Catbird. Turning for home, it's Dares J in front by three and a half lengths. Warm response, is second by two lengths. I want to win, third, market reaction, fourth, and Hasty Nymph. Into the stretch, it's Dares J in front by three lengths. Warm response, is second by three quarters of a length. I want to win, third, and Hasty Nymph. There's Jay in front. Uh, I want to win in warm response. There's Jay drawing out. There's Jay. I want to win in warm response. And there's Jay. He's the winner by two lengths. I want to win second with warm response. Finishing third. Johnny Longdon was the first one to congratulate him in the winner's circle. draped a blanket of white carnations over his shoulders. The champ, it said, 6,033. The place was jammed. Photographers, jockeys, track officials, friends. Well, it's a great day for Bill. I held it for 14 years, and I know it's going to be a whole lot longer before they break it again. I don't think many of us will see it, John. But, uh, I think it took a good man to make this record, and it took a damn good man to break it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Johnny Longdon. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a nice hand for the new world's winningest writer, Bill Shoemaker. Bill, I think uh, that there must have been a smile on the face of Johnny Longdon when you went to the front and never looked back. That's kind of right he'd kind of like. Yeah, that's true, and I'm, I'm sure that that's right. I know he was rooting for me all the way, and I was... Uh, I, without Longdon, I would never have been here today because he's the one that set the record that I was able to come along and break, and I'm glad that I could ride it as his style in front all the way. Never had there been a rider with a record quite like that of the shoe. Now, you might easily assume that Shu breaking the all-time record means that our story has come to a happy ending. Wrong, my friend. Happy was that day at Del Mar in 1970, but an ending? Not on your life. But Shoemaker went on and on. The milepost didn't stop at 6,033. He's gone on to win 7,000 and then 8,000. And he passed the $100 million mark in career earnings for his mounts. The great horses still came his way as the 70s flowed into the 80s and the gray hair blossomed on the head of America's legendary jockey. In recent years, he's been the partner for more champion thoroughbreds, horses like Fargo, Spectacular Bid, and another grand old man, a horse named John Henry. As Bill Shoemaker's career was winding down, he was still the same lively figure in the jocks room that he had always been. A few laughs, a friendly card game, Shoe truly was the dean of jockeys. And the chance to compete with the legend was a very special experience for young riders like Corey Black. Well, obviously, I guess the one thing to say is, you know, he's the greatest. I mean, unfortunately, I never got to see him ride in his prime. It's kind of scary for me to think of what he did when he was 30 years old now I see him 56 years old and he still does amazing things you know he's a very nice man you know he's very very helpful he's kind of the head of the jock stream. you know everybody looks up to him veteran riders like Lafitte Pinkai see another side of Shoemaker he's a very tough jockey especially now in the big races when he have a good horse he always uh He's tough. He's really tough. The art of race riding 
is often overlooked by sports fans when they assess their favorite athletes. Perhaps jockeys don't always get due credit because the powerful animal, which is their teammate, is himself so compelling and often outweighs the jockey by 10 to 1. To ride a 1,000-pound animal at 40 miles an hour, to make instant decisions, to use finesse and deception, as well as strength and timing, these take exceptional ability. Dr. Robert Curlin has studied thousands of professional athletes. To his amazement, Curlin said, jockeys tested better than all the others in athletic performance. When Shoemaker was away from the track, he could stop being the top athlete, the superstar, and enjoy his life as a husband and a father. On this day off, it was a busman's holiday for Shoe as he takes his family to a public stable. Cindy, an accomplished horsewoman, cuts a fine figure on a horse as she warms up. All right. Meanwhile, Dad lends a professional hand securing Amanda's helmet. Then he gives her a leg up, and away she goes. Couple of pretty good looking riders. When he was in the twilight of his remarkable career, Shoemaker always apportioned his life carefully. First, of course, came the family, then the work but he always found time to film a commercial or raise money for handicapped children's charities, like this one, called Ahead with Horses. His love for these kids is clearly seen, and it's more than returned in kind. The little boy is asked if he could show his new friend how he's learning to walk without the aid of his crutches. But now it was time for work. It's 1987, and the shoe and Charlie Whittingham had another major goal, the $3 million Breeders' Cup Classic at Hollywood Park. Their horse, Ferdinand, was four years old then, a former Kentucky Derby winner, challenged by a younger Derby winner, Ali Sheba. The tension ran high at Hollywood Park that day as the two brilliant Colts eased into position for a stretch run to see which was best. And Ferdinand to pick him up now on the outside third. Good command is putting in his run toward the rail. Skywalker is still in it. He's only three lengths off the lead. And Ali Sheba continues to pick him up on the outside with a dramatic run toward the leaders. They are at the corner pole here in Hollywood Park. And it is Judge Angelucci on the outside. Kenny's going toward the rail. Ferdinand and Ali Sheba coming on from the outside. Good command is in behind horses. They're less than a foot on out. Judge Angelucci desperate. Ferdinand right there. Ali Sheba on the outside. Ferdinand, Judge Angelucci on the outside. Ali Sheba. The finish was too close to call until the official photo was developed. Not even Chris McCarran on Ali Sheba or the shoe on Ferdinand could be sure until the crowd told them. It was the richest race in the world and it was one more moment for the shoe. Now the world's winningest race rider has hung up his tack after a farewell tour like none other in the history of sports. Bill Shoemaker spent 1989 saying goodbye to his fans. He traveled to 47 racetracks in 25 states and to 12 different countries. 
The world tour and the legend's career came to an end on February 3rd, 1990 at Santa Anita Park. As the shoe prepared to take that final bow, he couldn't help but be caught up in a rush of memories of the six different decades he had ridden to the post. Memories of all those thoroughbreds who had earned a total of more than $123 million, had won over 1,000 stakes events and 11 of the Triple Crown races. During the past 40 years, this remarkable athlete had ridden half the horses enshrined in the Racing Hall of Fame and eight Horse of the Year winners. On this day, over 64,000 fans turned out at Santa Anita. Millions more watched on national television as the 58-year-old legend said farewell. The emotion for the usually unemotional shoemaker could not be contained. I thank all these fellas behind me here that I've ridden with all these years, 30 or 40 years. I've had a lot of fun with them. Thank you very much. A jockey is an athlete whose partner is a horse. It sounds mundane enough when it's put that way, but there's a beauty to their effort that transcends the sweat and toil and routine of winning and losing. The harmony of man and horse has uplifted our spirits for many generations. And as we consider the career of Bill Shoemaker, let us not become so engrossed in the statistics that we fail to see his artistry. For that artistry will remain long after the record books are yellow in their time. One thing is sure, some years from now, a kid mucking out stalls and dreaming of making it big as a jockey one day is going to ask, hey, old timer, did you ever see the shoe ride? And somebody in a track kitchen is going to put down a chip coffee mug and say, the shoe? <laughs> Damn right I saw the shoe ride. And let me tell you something, kid. He was the best there ever was.